Hi Founder fans, Jason here, and today's founder is a British general. Yet again, this time we are talking about the general who essentially cleaned up the mess at the end of the war, Guy Carlton. And joining us to help with this series is, let's welcome back Michael Troy of the American Revolution Podcast. Michael, thanks for coming back. Hi Jason, good to see you. Absolutely. Now, this is the fourth time you're coming back, and it's the fourth and last time we'll be talking about someone who actually ran the British Army. So, just to get ahead of the game here, Guy Carlton comes and takes over at the end of the war, essentially overseeing the occupation or the evacuation of New York City. That's right. He's very involved in the pre-war era and, and is a commander throughout the war, but his time as commander in chief of North America comes. Well, he hears that the British are going to recognize independence just as he's getting on the boat to come over. Right. So I wanted to sum that up because we do want to talk about his whole career because he has a very several important moments in the American Revolution itself. Not his whole career, but the American Revolution part. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, he's he it's going to be a while. The end of the conversation when he actually takes over as head of the army. But let's talk a little bit about his earlier life. So so. I understand he served in several wars around Europe before, and, and North America before the American Revolution. That's right. Like most of the senior generals and most of the men who were of a certain age by the time the revolution came around, they'd fought in a couple of wars already. Um, Carleton was from Northern Ireland. He was a, a Protestant whose family lived in Northern Ireland and owned land, but they weren't a... Uh, um, an aristocrat. They didn't have a title. Uh, so he, he joined the army at a fairly young age, and his father died when he was very young, too. So he, he and his two brothers all joined the army at a pretty young age. They had money, so they went in as officers. He started off as an ensign at age 17, and that was um, about a year or two into the War of Austrian Succession, which was a major European war in the 1740s, uh, where, of course, England was at war with France, as they always were. And um, many uh, British officers cut their teeth in the Aus War of Austrian Succession. Yeah, as I said, it was in the 1740s, so it was about 30 years before. So all the young men who were just getting their careers started were senior officers by the time of the American Revolution. Now, Carleton didn't um, do a lot of fighting in that war. He actually spent most of it live in Britain. Um, but he was, um, there was the, the Jacobite rebellion happened during that time in Scotland. And he was at the um, Battle of Culloden, which a lot of people know about because it was a big massacre of Scottish rebels toward the end of the war. He was involved in that with his buddy, James Wolfe, who was another officer about the same age as him. Right. And James Wolfe does become very important to Carlton's story later on in the years. Yes, unlike Carleton, uh, Wolf is titled and very well connected, and so his rise through the ranks is much faster than Carleton's. Uh, I believe he's a colonel by the time Carleton's still a lieutenant, even though I think Wolf is two years younger than him. Right, but it becomes important because, as you said, it's a, a little bit surprising. You know, spoiler alert: uh, Carleton rises to pretty extreme heights for a gentleman who was not a gentleman. Uh, and I understand a lot of that was due to him. And uh, another guy, I believe the name was Richmond, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but yes, had... Richmond, who was a member of the House of Lords and a very influential member of the ministry, was a patron of his. Right. So he, he makes these two very important friends uh, who help him throughout. So years go by, and then Carlton ends up serving in the Seven Years War. Um, yeah, and unfortunately there he makes a very important enemy, uh, King George II. Uh, he ends up bad-mouthing the Hanoverian army during that war. Um, he was fighting over in, in the German states at the time. Um, George II, of course, was born in Hanover, was the leader of the Hanover state of Hanover, um, and didn't take kindly to a British officer bad-mouthing his uh, homeboys. Mm -hmm. So every time... Carlton was offered a decent position, the king personally stepped in and nixed it. So he didn't get to do a lot during the uh, Seven Years' War either. Um, until, uh, fortunately, um, his friend, General Wolfe, uh, um, 
was 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 really trying to get him get him involved, and the king refused. Uh, the only thing that really got him out from that behind that eight ball, he he did get some positions, but he was still in trouble. Um, was the death of King George II in 1760, and when King George III came in. George II and George III did not really get along with each other. So anybody that George II hated, George III pretty much liked. Fair enough. Oh, oh my! Oh, you didn't like my dad? Well, come on over. <laughs> it's funny while you're saying this, I'm sitting here He's thinking. Grandfather, actually, but yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Look right past it. Um. Well, I'm sitting here thinking the whole time. Uh, we um, in the last few ser- episodes of this series, we've discussed how bad mouthing your superiors was a pretty good way to get ahead. But I suppose when you make it up to the top. Bad mouthing the king is not a good way to get ahead. No, the king is is beyond um, criticism. You can you can never uh, uh, criticize the king. That's never a good thing. And if, if you get on the king's bad side, yeah, that's the end of your career. He usually. has no reason to forgive you. <laughs> right. Right. So back to Carlton. Uh, yeah. He he does, despite being disliked by a certain monarch. Uh, does succeed and does make his way up through the ranks, uh, and then he does come over for the Seven Years' War. Now, I understand he didn't participate. Well, let's talk about it. Well, do you, what do you know about his role in the Seven Years' War? Well, he does end up going to fight with his friend General Wolf, who's a major general by this time. He, he's a lieutenant colonel. Uh, Wolf is a major general. Wolf is given command at Quebec. Um, George II, I believe, eventually relents and lets. Um, uh, um, Carlton joined Wolf uh, for the attack in Quebec, and he's very conspicuous in his uh, um, bravery at, at the siege of Quebec, uh, which I think was 1758, and is shot in the head, actually. Um, Wolf is killed at the battle. Uh, Carlton is very badly wounded with a head wound, um, but obviously survives, but spends the next couple of years in England recuperating. Uh, then towards the very end of the Seven Years' War, he gets involved in a, a battle off the coast of France and then goes to Cuba, where he participates in the uh, uh, Havana campaign to take Havana, Cuba from the Spanish. All right. So he's been around the world, uh, made a bit of a name for himself. And then, as you said before, the new king comes in. So he is essentially cleared for takeoff when it comes to rising through the ranks. So what does he do? I'm sorry. I was going to say, that's where his career really takes off because uh, King George III takes a liking to him. He has some very important backers. Well, not he doesn't have Wolf anymore, unfortunately. Wolf is dead. But he, uh, the Duke of Richmond becomes, oh, I forget his position. He was a very important member of the ministry at the time, though, and gets Carleton an appointment as Lieutenant Governor of Quebec. So he comes back to North America as number two in Quebec, but for all intents and purposes, Canada at large. Right, and and he's essentially running uh, Canada because the uh, governor is somebody who's not particularly interested and and is living in England. So when he comes over to Quebec, he's pretty much running the show. Right, and he seems to do a fair job considering he is a British governor or lieutenant governor overseeing French citizens. Right. This was a tricky situation right after the war. Canada, of course, was, or at least Quebec, was French uh, up until the very end of the war. Um, the British captured it and the French ceded it in the treaty that ended the war. And suddenly all these Frenchmen were British subjects. And uh, there were some parts of Canada where they actually uh, um, removed all the French subjects and, and forced them, expelled them from the region. The Acadians are, are a big one. They were from Acadia, which is in Canada. They all went down to Louisiana and became Cajuns, which is where that name comes from. But uh, Quebec, I guess there were too many. And by that time, the war was over, so they weren't seen as much of a threat. So the, the, the people of Quebec, uh, the Frenchmen, were allowed to stay there. And Carleton actually takes a very uh, light touch to them. He um, allows them to continue to practice many of the, the French ways of doing things. He supports the Catholic Church, which for Protestant Britain is almost unheard of. Uh, <laughs> prior to the capture of Quebec, there was only one place in the entire British Empire where you could hold mass. 
uh, and that was Pennsylvania. Um, every other part of the empire, it was illegal to hold a Catholic mass. That's how hostile Britain was to Catholicism, mostly because if you were Catholic, it meant you were French or Spanish, which were the traditional enemies of, of Great Britain. Right. So anyway, Carlton allows it. He supports tithing uh, laws that require people to tithe to the Catholic Church. Um, he puts the bishops uh, back into positions of power and the French landowners in positions of power and kind of keeps things running the way they were just with the British crown at the top instead of the French crown. And, and it works very well. Right. The, the people seem to be very happy with the situation as it, as it goes along. Well, it's very interesting because this is the situation when the Quebec Act is passed in 17, uh, 70, or goes to effect in 1774. Uh, um, and famously, the American patriots don't care for the Quebec Act for what I understand are basically two reasons. That it primarily keeps French common law, which it sounds like essentially Carlton was already doing. Uh, and it permitted them to practice Catholicism, which yeah, Carl, it sounds Carlton like Carlton was, was a, already doing. <laughs> Carlton was a huge advocate of the um, of the Quebec Act. He actually ended up going back to um, England in 1770, I believe, um, when he was he was actually promoted to governor at that point and came back for consultations, which he thought would be a few months. He ended up spending four years in England consulting. Uh, and, um, and implementing <laughs> during the time uh, he was promoting what became the Quebec Act. And as you said, it, it left in place many of the French laws and traditions. Uh, the thing that really ticked off most of the colonists was it gave the entire Ohio Valley to Quebec. So right. all that land that they had been fighting for during the French and Indian War and prior wars that, you know, the British colonies wanted to keep British colonies all of a sudden Britain said, yeah, we're giving that to Quebec. So it's not yours anymore, Virginia. Sorry, Pennsylvania. Sorry, New York. You're all out of luck. No, thank uh, you. And Connecticut. So, Don't get Connecticut. <laughs> right. So yeah, everybody was unhappy about that. Right. So they saw, you know, basically Britain was, was going over to the other side, essentially. They were saying, we're going to let all these French Catholics take over our <laughs> entire frontier and, and cut us out of it. So yeah, they were not happy about that. Yeah. But and that's uh, actually one of the things quoted in the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's very interesting because uh, about this time, you know, 1774, later that year, they go to the First Continental Congress. And one of the things the First Continental Congress does is send a letter to Canada saying, hey, you should come next year when we have the second one of these. Um, and I understand Carlton essentially lets that, he doesn't let it get published in the newspaper, but there's a gentleman, is it John Brown, uh, comes from yeah. Massachusetts, uh, and he lets him try and spread his propaganda and get people on board. Yeah, John Brown was a big Massachusetts patriot, not to be confused with the uh, abolitionist of a few generations later. Uh, he was actually a huge opponent of uh, Benedict Arnold, too, really, the two men who really hated each other. Yeah. But yeah, John Brown went up to Quebec and was trying to say, hey, you know, freedom, independence, all this. Well, I guess they weren't really pushing independence at the time, but unity against the <laughs> oppression that we're all facing. Right. And um, yeah, he didn't get thrown in jail or anything. Car uh, Carlton basically, with his light touch, basically said, well, you know, people are going to say what they're going to say, but you're all British subjects and this is what we're going to do. Right, despite the fact Brown is basically actively opposing what Carlton had essentially helped put in place. <laughs> yeah. And um, I should also mention um, Carlton got married while he was in England. So he brought his wife back to Quebec with him. Um, and his wife was 30 years his junior. He was, I think, 48. She was 19 when, when they got married. So uh, yeah, was he started. She, uh, uh, so not royalty, but um, nobility. Uh, her father was a, um, he was a lord. Uh, he, he, uh, he, I forget his exact title, but he, he was aristocracy. Uh, he was also a general, uh, might have been a major general, a lieutenant general in the British Army. He died actually, though, a couple of years before they got married. So uh, her father was never any kind of help to Carlton's career or anything. Okay. But, uh, you know, 
You got a 19 year old, so yeah, we have fair enough. He took he took the hard way. Usually those marriages are for uh uh to raise your status in the community. So he really never he's really kind of a surprising character to be in the situation that he's in. Right. He never really married for gain. He was already governor and as I said in his late forties by the time he decided it, he needed to get married. So uh yeah, I think it was a desire for companionship. Right, fair enough. All right, well, let's get into the fun stuff. So he's there, uh, go, getting into 1775. Uh, he's running Quebec. Quebec doesn't join, much like the Floridas. The Canadas do not join, despite many invitations. Uh, they don't join the Patriots. And uh, a war breaks out down in Massachusetts. So Carlton suddenly finds himself essentially overseeing... I, I know at this point, uh, Gage is arriving... No, no, I'm sorry, Gage is there, and Clinton is already arriving in Massachusetts, but Carlton is essentially the resident authority at this point when it comes to leading British men. Uh, so how does he react to the war? Yeah, well, it gets real serious for Carlton real fast, because only a month after Lexington and Concord, uh, the Americans come over and, and take Fort Ticonderoga, and a few days after that, Benedict Arnold sails a fleet up of Lake Champlain and begins attacking ports in Canada. Uh, so Carleton immediately has to um, assemble whatever troops he can, and he really doesn't have a lot. I think there's probably less than two full regiments in Canada at the time, uh, not a lot of people. And um, the Americans invade Quebec uh, that fall and winter, and well we jumped ahead a little bit first they uh come up to montreal if i'm not mistaken oh did you mean yeah. quebec at large i'm sorry not quebec city i apologize the region of quebec fair enough uh, right quebec is both a region and a city um you know, as someone who lives in new york and not new york city i should have been a lot better at that <laughs> uh yeah so anyway but yeah carlton is actually in um in montreal um when the americans invade and you have uh, General Richard Montgomery, who's coming up through New York. And at the same time, you have Colonel Benedict Arnold, who does his famous wilderness march across uh, what is today Maine. It was at the time the Massachusetts wilderness um, and attacks from the other side. And um, Carleton finds himself really kind of outmaneuvered and is almost captured. The ship he's on is captured and all the men on it are captured. The only reason he got off was because he snuck off the night before and dressed as a French peasant and walked back to Quebec. And he actually was in houses where there were American officers, but his French was so good that they assumed he was really just a French uh, peasant and, and let him continue on his way. Oh, wee oui, oui. So, so <laughs> yeah, he, he gets back to Quebec City, which is of course, coming under siege now by the Americans. Um, he manages to get a few companies of Scottish loyalists who are Scottish immigrants who had come to, to the uh, Quebec region a few years earlier. And they basically save Quebec from the all out attack that Arnold and Montgomery launched at the end of 1775. Uh, General Montgomery, of course, is killed in that battle and Benedict Arnold gets his first of several <laughs> very bad wounds. Um, so, um, but yeah, he, he, he holds Quebec, um, keeps it all winter with his very small force that is kept under siege for the entire time. Uh, and in the spring, the American fleet, or the American fleet, the British fleet shows up at Quebec and, and reclaims the city. And at that point, Carleton's a hero because he's basically been able to hold the, the, entire region for Britain by holding Quebec City. Um, right, all he really the, loses is Montreal, but then right. the troops show and up once, under... Once, once the reinforcements get there, they push the Americans pretty quickly out of Montreal and back into New York. Right. Um, a big part of that was because so many Americans were dying of smallpox on the campaign, but regardless, <laughs> uh, Car Carleton takes the win. He's considered a hero. He... Um, gets his knighthood at that time, and um, also gets promoted to lieutenant general. Right. So Sir Guy Carlton now is a big to-do. Um, 
I do understand Ber, uh, John Burgoyne shows up. Uh, Burgoyne was the head of the reinforcements that arrived in the spring. So they kind of work together to push their way down to Montreal. For now, they work together. <laughs> uh, as we know, there will be backstabbing when it comes to the generals in the Continental. Oh. I'm in the British Army. Uh, so they do push down, and then they decide to, um, well, follow down the Hudson, or not the Hudson yet, uh, north of the Hudson is uh, Ticonderoga. Champlain, I found it. Lake Champlain, they decide to go down. Right. The, the, the plan then is to move down Lake Champlain and take back Fort Ticonderoga, which is called the Gibraltar of North America, which I never quite understood because everybody seems to conquer it without any problem at all. But um, <laughs> it was supposed to be a really big deal. So Carleton builds this fleet to counter the fleet that's been built by Benedict Arnold on Lake Champlain, and he spends the entire year of 1776 trying to build this massive fleet so that he can completely overwhelm the Americans. This is kind of the same strategy that we see General Howe using. They don't want to risk any, even a close battle. They want every battle to be absolutely an assured victory for the British. And Arnold actually gives them a few twists at the Battle of Accor Island. He sneaks around behind them, pounds uh, a few of their ships, and uh, eventually, although most of Arnold's fleet is sunk, uh, manages to escape with his most of his crew back to Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, but the real thing Arnold did in that was he delayed Carleton for the entire year. It wasn't until November of 76 that they finally reached Fort Ticonderoga. And as tended to happen in that era, it began to snow. Uh, it, it was, an, you know, it got, it got a lot colder a lot earlier. Uh, back I then know what it's like in November in upstate New York. Yes. <laughs> so, and in the eight, 1700s, they were still in the middle of the Little Ice Age, so it actually got even worse. Um, Carlton was afraid that he, he, he could have besieged the fort, and maybe the Americans would have given up within a few weeks, but if they didn't, he would have had to withdraw because he was afraid of the lake freezing over and then the Americans basically could just walk out to the ship and kill him. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to retreat. He didn't even want to launch the attack because he wasn't assured of an overwhelming win. So he pulled back to Canada. Right. And so we, that, before we move past the Battle of Valcour Island, you it, depending on who was talking about it, I usually get different responses to who actually is the victor in that battle. I, I understand it's kind of like Bunker Hill, where technically the British won, uh, but st strategically the Patriots kind of came out on top. Does that make sense? That's right. Yeah, that, no, that's absolutely right. The uh, Carlton has a large fleet. He's completely outgunned his opponents, uh, and he ends up sinking most of the uh, American ships. It captures one. Um, a few of the Americans just drive into the shore and set on fire to deny the British from capturing them. But right, Carleton takes Lake Champlain and he wins. But as I said, in doing so, he wasted the entire fighting season um, and ended up having to pull back. So yes, he writes back and says, hey, we cleared Lake Champlain. It was a great victory. We're all happy. Many of his subordinates, including Burgoyne, write back saying, well, yeah, but it took forever, and we still haven't conquered uh, Fort Ticonderoga because, you know, Carleton's being a grandma and refuses to actually, you know, engage in a serious fight. Um, Burgoyne goes back to Britain that winter, ostensibly for health reasons. Um, what he really needed to deal with was the health of his career because he starts talking to uh, people like Lord Germain and King George and telling them that we really need a firmer hand on the rudder in Quebec. We need somebody who's going to push harder and push faster. And Oh, by the way, I'm available for that if you want, want me to go back and do it. Right, so, a good old-fashioned talking trash about your superior British army. <laughs> absolutely. And um, um, Lord Germain, who's the, the Secretary of State for North American Affairs, um, and as I've mentioned, you know, hated most of the generals, absolutely hated Carleton. Um, Carleton... Um, had bad mouthed his prior military performance, and so the two guys hated each other. What was so, his superior? That's what you're supposed to do in the British Army. So, but yeah, anyway, so 
Jermaine is very happy to have Burgoyne, you know, basically shove Carlton aside and sends him back and says, all right, uh, Burgoyne is in charge of the 77 campaign. He's going to lead the invasion into New York. And Carlton, you're going to keep a reserve force in Canada uh, just to, you know, protect Canada while we're doing this big invasion. So he's basically shunted aside. Um, Carlton, of course, is very upset by this and submits his resignation. And it's accepted? It is not accepted. Of course. Um, <laughs> they sit on it for a while. And, well, it's not accepted right away. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, and Burgoyne, of course, famously marches to, into New York, gets as far as Saratoga, runs into a little trouble there, and uh, finds a new career as prisoner of war. So Carlton is now stuck with a just a really small rump force in Quebec and is in very great danger of a counterattack. So they're all freaking out and trying to do whatever they can to build up defensive measures and all that good stuff. So by this time, we're into spring of 1778. Uh, Britain's still trying to decide how they want to react to all this. And they eventually decide they're going to accept Carleton's resignation. And they do, um, mostly at the encouragement of Lord Germain. And they send over Friedrich Haldeman to take over the command at Quebec. Um, uh, Carleton returns to Britain and is basically giving a BS job. He becomes governor of... Um, some really tiny town in Northern Ireland. In Ireland, to... yeah. Um, Charlemont, Charlemont. In Northern Ireland. It's this tiny town you've never heard of because it, you know, it has six people living in it or something and pays a thousand pounds a year to, to hold this position, which is a lot of money at the time. I mean, the average uh, unskilled laborer at the time lived on about 30 pounds a year. So this is a thousand pounds a year you're getting paid to basically sit around and do nothing. Um, Great. Lord Germain is apoplectic about this decision of the king to give him this job. And, and he actually says that if the king goes through with the appointment, he's going to resign. The king goes through with the appointment and he backs out and right. he says, I'm really not going to resign. But he was, he was not happy about his arch enemy getting this really cushy job. So Carlton really does nothing for the next few years except hang around in Northern Ireland. He sits on a few committees that look at, um, uh, you know, administrative stuff within the army, but really nothing important. Right. Um, the, the show is really being run by Clinton at this point and by um, uh, General Cornwallis, who's leading the Southern campaign in the 1780, early 1780s. And then, of course, Yorktown happens, and um, Cornwallis gets a new career as prisoner of war. So um, at that point, they recall Clinton. Uh, we're talking about 1782 now, by time of war of Yorktown gets, gets back to Britain, and they need to send a new commander-in-chief to take command in North America. And uh, Haldeman, I think, always kind of gets gypped because he's a very senior officer and really deserved to be made commander several times. Unfortunately, he was um, born in, I believe, Switzerland. He's of Prussian descent. He wasn't an Englishman. He wasn't oh. somebody who was, you know, considered part of the establishment. So even though he had spent decades as a British officer and a capable general, they never really wanted to give him command of the entire region to someone like that. So he kind of gets screwed. You could see their reasoning for that. That's, I want to say, understandable in their perspective. You know, from our perspective, maybe not. But from their perspective, being British was very important. <laughs> right. And being a member of the British establishment. The aristocracy. Yeah, exactly. Right. You, you don't want somebody who doesn't have lots of family in the uh, in the aristocracy because they're more likely to lead a revolution someday. Okay. So yeah, so they um they choose Carlton. So they choose Carlton, and Carlton goes back to uh, um, New York to become commander of North America. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset of this, um, 
by the way, when he's getting on the boat, by the way, we're going to recognize American independence and sign a treaty. So, you know, have fun over there. Uh, Carlton is really upset by that. And he, he doesn't even want to go at that point. He wants to resign. He says, no, why would you? Go ahead. Have he's, fun he's losing back. the war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then he'd be back to just be a quitter. Um, but they say, yeah, sorry, you signed up for it. You're going. Um, and he goes to New York. And basically, his job is to extricate the British army and British um, civilians, the loyalists who want to leave uh, the, the, the United States, which they're now recognizing as an independent nation, um, to help all those people leave that want to leave. And he actually gets into a huge fight with George Washington about this. Right, they meet in person. They do several times, yes, because yeah. they're trying to work out the, um, the, the, the application of the Treaty of Paris. Um, Carleton, among the refugees he's removing are 3,000 slaves who had escaped from Patriot masters and fled to New York. And um, George Washington says, no, the treaty specifically requires that you leave all property behind. You can't take property that you seized from the Americans. And Carleton essentially says, yeah, we already promised these people their freedom. We're not going to go back on that. If you want, if you have a problem with it, uh, take it up with the ministry and maybe they'll reimburse you for the cost of the slaves. Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of the agreement they come to. Washington only kind of accepts it because he has no other choice. They're going to do it and he's not going to really fight a battle to stop it. So, um, you know, they, they put in their claims for the cost of the slaves to the British ministry and the British ministry said, yeah, good luck with that. We're not paying it. Well, so. yeah, we'll get around to it. Sure. Yeah, we'll look into that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they were basically, the British were saying, yeah, and you promised to pay all the Tories for all the stuff you took from them. So when's that going to happen? Right. There were a lot of broken promises with that treaty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it did end the war and it did gain independence. So uh, Carlton is in New York for about two years uh, and he leaves with the final evacuee, evacuees, refugees. Yes, he, he, he's one of the, the, the final people to um, leave New York when they finally turn it back over to the Americans. Most of the refugees end up going to Halifax, but they really go all over the place. Some go down to the West Indies, some go back to Britain. Uh, a large number of the black slaves uh, end up, some go to Halifax, some go to London. Uh, the British aren't terribly happy about having a lot of Africans in London. Uh, sadly, some things never change, racial prejudice and all that. Um, and the Blacks, uh, many of them, or the overwhelming number of them, end up going back to Africa and forming uh, the colony of Sierra Leone. Which was fairly common at the time. America would, a couple decades later, do the same thing uh, uh, with the American Colonization Society where they, uh, the idea was, you know, the best, the best way to live. And I'm not saying this was the right idea, but the one of many ideas at the time was a good way to liberate black people would be to give, create a free colony in Africa that they could return to. There were many people in both America and Britain who believed that blacks and whites could not live together as free people, that blacks could only live in white society as slaves where they were properly controlled and trained and, and, and racism essentially oh yeah yeah well we know that's not right now <laughs> right right but you know, people sometimes forget that you know we think racism is this horrible thing which it is but racism was the norm in the 18th and 19th century everybody truly believed that blacks were inferior to whites that they were somehow subhuman sort of between animal and human right. and that they really couldn't live in a civilized society they genuinely believed this as fact um you know, it's a shameful part of our history, but it's it's a reality. Um, so, right, uh, the Americans and the Brits wanted to take free blacks and send them back to Africa so they'd be away from white society. Right. I mean, I, we should note that this is about the time many people are starting to be enlightened to the idea that that is not necessarily the case. But uh, you're right, it's... There right, was, there, there was are a driving people. force behind the idea of colonization. Right, and you know, in the same period, we're seeing the real beginnings of a serious abolition movement, both in Britain and in, in the Americas. 
Uh, and in France. Um, I, I, well, absolutely. Only 15 years before France just says, we're all done. <laughs> well, well, the French Revolution outlaws slavery in France, but uh, they still keep slaves in French colonies because it's just too, too valuable to give those up. Right, fair. Uh, they also the, beheaded a whole lot of people, so we shouldn't look too generously on the French Revolution. <laughs> yeah, but... Um, yeah, we, we do see the beginning of the abolition movement and the um, governor who takes over for Carleton in Canada. Uh, Canada gets divided into Upper Canada and Lower Canada. And um, which Carlton, the governor... That's under Carlton, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Carlton goes back to Canada. He does. He, he skipped he, ahead. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, we did skip ahead a little bit. Carlton goes back to um, Britain for quite a few years. Um, but in 1786, he becomes governor of British North America, which at that point essentially meant Canada, like Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, St. John's. Um, so he goes back and does that, and he actually works to set up this new system of governing, which basically takes all those different um, separate colonies and forms them into Upper Canada and Lower Canada. So they're basically just run by two uh, ruling forces. And the uh, the person who takes command in Upper Canada is somebody uh, fans of the show Turn are familiar with. It's um, John Graves Simcoe, yeah. who becomes governor of Upper Canada. And he actually is uh, one of the first British leaders to implement complete abolition and completely abolishes slavery in Upper Canada. Um, I understand in Canada, he's looked at as, I don't want to say kind of a hero, but... Uh... He's one of the more important figures in early Canadian history. He is, an important, he is an important leader, and he was very forward thinking on the issue of slavery and other issues. So, yes, I mean, despite what... Because he kind of helped think. create Toronto, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was called York at the time. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm not 100% positive of that, but I do believe... It we in America be look very negatively on a person that Canada looks very positively on. Right. Well, because you remember we have so we had tens of thousands of loyalists moving from New England and New York to Canada. And that's actually why uh, York was founded. It was basically became loyalist. And that's why Canada, up until that time, a great large portion of Canada was essentially French. And this is really what's turning Canada into English, and not only English, but very loyalist English, because it was all the loyalists who went there. Right. I mean, the Queen is still on their money today. Yeah. <laughs> Great. You're welcome, Canada. There, we're bringing in some Canadian history for you today. <laughs> so uh, uh, to wrap up Carlton, he is uh, comes back to Canada, uh, helps separate the upper and lower Canada, as we said, into essentially French Canada and English Canada, which, speaking of racism, would end up not <laughs> not being great for Canada for a little bit there, uh, especially in the hockey world. Um, and then uh, he's there for, what, what, like a decade? He's there for a while again. Yeah, he's there for about a decade. During that time, he um, um, gets a... Uh, um, Baron a title, yeah, he becomes the first Baron Dorchester. Okay, there uh, is. <laughs> which is a title in England. Um, it's also the 1790s, which we're starting that another war with France because you know it's another decade, it's another war with France. The Napoleons and are here. Yeah. Like all the other, like all the other generals, uh, Carlton gets his redemption and gets promoted to full general in 1793 as part of the effort to. Uh, um, you know, give everybody a promotion during the new war. So he finally leaves Canada in 1796. And at that point, he is settling into his estate in England. And essentially, he's retired at that point. He's in his 70s by this point. Uh, but you also have to remember his wife was in her 40s. And he still had like a two year old child at this point, um, you know, the last of his 11 children or something. Right. Um, so, yeah, he's still raising children um, when he's in retirement in England. Right. In well, the well, two things. I understand at this point he's sitting in the House of Lords because he's he, no, is. he has made his way from nothing, essentially. to Well, not nothing, but he's made his way from middling society to nobility. Right. He's made his way into the nobility. And um, 
And then additionally, yeah. And then additionally, I I noticed I was reading up a little bit today on him, and I noticed a lot of his, he has many children, and a lot of his sons die young at war. Almost all of them do. Yeah, he has he has eleven children. I think nine of them were male, and um, I think one of them two, lives to thirty. Two of them died in infancy. Yeah. The other six, I believe. All or six out of seven died as officers in the war. All of them died in their 20s or 30s, and most of them died before Carlton did in 1808. Right. Uh, so he, he he buries most of his children. They 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 have very good careers as officers in the British Army and are, you know do their father proud. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, sadly most of them die. The only one who lives any length of time, I think, is his youngest son. Who becomes a uh, minister in a local parish? He he avoids the military life, okay. which I guess appears to have been a good call. Well, he's watching uh, all of these older brothers die. <laughs> yeah. Maybe but it's time I, for I, something else. <laughs> so, some of the brothers did lo live long enough to have issue, so his uh, title does carry for a few generations, although it does die out in the 19th century. Um, but one of his descendants is. Um, General Sir Mark Carlton Smith, who is currently Britain's chief of general staff. So there's still a prominent fixture in British government to this day. I don't know a lot about a chief of general staff. Is that like, like, I think, for the it's, prime I, think minister? It's like a, I think it's like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in America, something similar to that. Okay, so so he did it. So Guy Carlton, all that hard work and watching all those sons die off ends up paying off at least a little bit. So, right. Well, the Carltons have a long vaunted military tradition that really starts with Guy. He's the first member of his family to really become a prominent officer. Well, that's amazing. I think this was an extremely thorough review of Guy Carlton's life. Michael, I, thank you so much for coming back and helping me dive through the weeds on this fascinating uh, anti-founder. My pleasure. Founder fans, I forgot which button hit. Thank you so much for watching this whole video. Uh, Michael, uh, Troy, thank you again so much for coming. Check out the link in the description. If you're not watching the American Revolution podcast, if you're not learning about the American Revolution, you need to go check it out. Make sure you hit like, and if you made it this far, subscribe because we put out videos five days a week about the American Revolution.